What separates a church in which God's hand and anointing is upon and a church in which the motions are simply gone through um, repetitively and repeatedly with no sense of power attending the motions? That's the question we want to consider tonight. What's the difference between a church that's attended by the the power of the living God and a church that's just going through the motions? And I would submit to you one of the answers is that a church that is dynamic and growing and advancing the mission of God is led by, and I'm going to say this as a phrase and it might sound familiar, but it's very specific from our text, spirit-filled men who have been set apart and called of God for the work of ministry. And we're going to see in our text tonight that that's exactly what is happening. And so what I want to do is I want to use this text tonight as a bit of a case study for how God has always worked in the church and how he continues to work today. Because I want us, I want, we've called this series, How to Be a Jesus-Filled Church. And part of the intention and hope is to kind of pull back the curtain behind how we do church so that the collective IQ, the, the collective ecclesiological IQ of our church could rise in how we think about church and how we live into our identity as the church so that, that there can be just a growing sense of, of hunger uh, as a church for the things of God and to become a kind of church that Jesus uses and moves through and works in for the glory of God. Because what's tempting to think is... is um, Well, let me put it this way. If you're new and sitting here, what church is not is a a weekly event, a weekly ticketed event where people come to watch a band and a guy perform. That's not what this is. This is the family of God that requires leadership like any family does for it to be cohesive and for it to have order and direction. But this is the family of God where we come and we come to mutually edify uh, each other with faith and encouragement. We come to love and where we come to collectively turn each other's attention to Jesus because you and I are prone to um, lose sight of him regularly. We have, we have day-to-day distractions and we have hurt and pain and we have, we have busy lives and things going on. And, and one of the things that gathering as a church accomplishes is collectively a turning our hearts and the attention of our heart to Jesus. And that requires leadership. And that requires structure uh, in organization and order. Now, uh, what I'm going to say tonight, you might tend to think, well, how does this really apply to me? Or I don't plan on going into full-time ministry. Here's why I want you to care about it. I want you to care about it because whether you stay at Gracie Church or God moves you somewhere else in the valley or somewhere else in the world, I want you to be an educated, well-informed, biblical Christian who discerns um, where the move of God is working in a church so you can join him there and participate in it. I want us to, I want us to have a, a, um, an increased sense of biblical IQ when it comes to uh, things about the church. And one of the key marks of a, of a church where God's presence will attend and his power will move is a church that's led by spirit-filled men, divinely set apart uh, by God um, in response to his call to do the work of ministry. And that, and, and, Surprisingly, that's a very, very controversial statement to make in today's very pluralistic and egalitarian uh, culture to which we were like, we don't care, whatever. It's like the culture is eating itself alive and burning itself down. Why would we want to do anything that the culture would agree with? <laughs> you know what I mean? Not that we're anti-culture, but like who, as you look out, you're like, who wants to be part of that circus sideshow? You know what I mean? And so that the church would say things that the culture would say, that's just, it's like, well, okay, it must be right. At least it must be, uh, it must be, I have something to it. Uh, what I'm going to say as well comes from years of experience that, it, 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 that uh, the Lord has given me that's consistent with, I believe, my calling and, and my uh, gifting uh, and then the experiences that God's given me, the things I've been able to deserve. I've been able to sit in the front row and watch very, very, in very close and personal ways God move and call specifically men, to lead the church. It, it, it's, a, it's, it's, it's holy ground to watch that process uh, take place, to be a part of that process 
and to call that process out of men for the sake of Jesus and their families and, and the church. I've also been a part of, of movements, large organizations, and, and churches that don't understand this. And I'll tell you, it has consequences. Because simply appearing to play church is very different than experiencing the anointing of God on a church that's on mission. And, and, and we take very, very seriously the anointing of God. We take very, very seriously the, the approval of God. None of the men here at Grace City Church in leadership in, in, in the, uh, on the elder team, none of the men here uh, and women serving on our pastoral team and serving in Dorhold, none of us here, and I can say this for all of us, none of us have any interest in being a part of something and attempting to accomplish things that, that we we're pretty confident we could do if you give us enough time in our own strength. All of us are united in our heart that we want to tackle obstacles and climb hills and attack strongholds of the enemy that um, only have a prayer of success if the mighty arm of God shows up to save. Full stop. And if the things we're calling you to do as a church and the way in which we're calling all of us to live as a church, if those things could be explained or done in man's strength, it's probably not faithful to the actual genuine call of God and assignment he would send us on as a church. Because all throughout Acts, what we see God doing by his spirit is calling the church to accomplish things they had no business thinking they could do unless God showed up in a supernatural way and did something um, extraordinary. So I return to my question, um, what sets apart the church that's attended by God's power? I think the answer is, a church that's led by spirit-filled men, divinely called of God to lead the church. Now I get this from Acts 13, so let's read these, uh, just the, we're just going to read three verses uh, and, and then look at how it applies to our church. Number, verse number one, now in the church of Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Stop there. We know Antioch was, was a, a big town with a church that was vibrant and growing. People were getting saved and baptized, filled with the Spirit, and sent out on mission, and there, there were prophets and teachers. What's the difference? Prophets are, are those who have that, that, when they deliver the word of truth, it has a razor edge that cuts to the bone. Teachers are those that explain and unpack uh, the word of God in, in ways that make sense to kind, of, to kind of build up the body of Christ. So prophets are, are cutting through all the noise of the darkness and the culture and the lies, and then teachers are, those, are explaining the truth of God in a way that, that builds up the body of Christ and strengthens the church. There were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, um, Manon, who had been brought up from up with Herod the Tetrarch. He was like one of his good friends. And Saul, verse 2, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Such a loaded sentence. One of the problems with the American church, and again, this isn't meant to be critical, and, and, and I don't like lobbing shots at folks because we got our own enough warts to keep us busy working and growing in, in our life, but one of, one of the problems with the lack of power in the American church is it's being led by professional men trained in institutions rather than being led by spirit-filled men called of God and divinely set apart for his work. To the point where I have met with pastors of churches in this town and around our area who I'm not, not, not only am, am I questioning whether or not they're saved, they're openly confessing like they're not saved. Like, like they're, it's, they're in it as a profession. They're in it um, as a career path. They're not in it because they were divinely called by God and filled with his spirit for mission. Now you may think that sounds weird, it is everywhere. It is everywhere. And when I talk about calling, and we'll get into it here in a moment, I mean a man who has such a burning sense of clarity and vision in his heart that to not follow it would be tantamount for him to sin. And that is not the prevalence scenario for most men leading the church today. It's a job, it's a career path, and I'm ashamed to say it, but it's a comfortable indoor job. 
that if they just kind of keep their head down and get by on Sundays, uh, they can mail it in. And it's a, it's a damning statement on um, the state of pulpits and churches in America. And I'm not saying that's across the board. There are hundreds of thousands of, uh, potentially millions of very, very, very godly, godly called men. And there are entire denominations full of men that do not qualify for ministry according to this text. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, I, I just want to acknowledge there, got quiet in here all of a sudden. Is this more serious? I'm not meaning this to be too serious, but we're all like, oh, okay, here we go. I can smile. I'm happy. I'm not angry. <laughs> this, it says they were worshiping and fasting. We know that God was working the church of Antioch in a, in, in, in a wonderful way. And yet they're still worshiping and fasting. Don't presume and assume on the presence and blessing of God. Pursue it. Right? Don't, don't assume, oh, well, God's got his hand on us. We'll sit back and just kind of watch him go. Never presume on the hand of God. Pursue the presence of God. That's why I regularly gather and we pray. Not in this way that we're going like, to conjure up the, the, the God's spirit because we earned it, but because we genu- genuinely desire it. So they're, they're fasting and praying. The Lord, through the Holy Spirit, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. So they're, they're praying and, and worshiping and seeking God. God speaks to them with direction and relationship to two men among them that are, are to be set apart and sent out. They fast and pray afterwards, in which I believe they're confirming that word. And then they, they, they lay hands on them to commission them and they send them out. So the question is, with those three verses, what can we learn about the Holy Spirit and calling? Well, here, I'm just going to riff through these quickly. And you're like, how does this affect me? It affects you because I want you to, to participate in this kind of church and pray for this kind of church. And maybe there's someone here who what I'm going to talk about tonight is becoming true of you. Even going this way of their career path, God's going to interrupt that and call you into full-time ministry. Because as Grace City Church goes, we're 15 years in, which in, in the life cycle of a church is very, very, very young. And as we've been planting this church and establishing this work, one of the things we're going to move into in the seasons to come is we're going to be even more intentionally, we've always been ascending church, but there's going to come a season and time when our children who've been raised in this church and have the ethos of this church in their bones are going to be of the age where they're, they're going to be sent out. Like, for instance, um, the elders and executive leaders team of this church, uh, uh, Adam James, uh, Kent McMullen, um, Kyle Strong, Josh McPherson, we all have boys. And Kyle McMullen is, has already followed his father in full-time ministry. And God is putting that kind of desire on Ben and Maddox and Levi. And we're not going to poo-poo it. I had a conversation with pastors this week. And, and, and the conversation went like this. Hey, I got a brother who God's calling to ministry, but as a policy, I don't hire relatives. And so if you, if you need him, I'd love to send him your way. And I was like, well, now I got to say something. So I jump on there. I was, I was like, hey, talking for a friend here, w- w- why do you have a policy where you wouldn't hire your brother? I, I said, no shade, just, just curious my brother is my best friend, my right-hand guy, and he leads us, except for tonight because his voice is smashed because he's teaching so much. He's my right-hand guy. He leads in worship every, mor- every Sunday morning and Thursday night to set the table in the hearts of the people for me to, to preach. He's been one of my right-hand guys and partners from the day we started. Uh, my dad is an elder emeritus who sits in the front row and who, who, who functions as a chaplain and pastor for my staff team, my ESAT team, my legacy team. He loves them, shepherds them. My cousin works for us. My brother's wife works for us. My wife, it's like, it's a family business. We have fathers and sons. We have two sets of brothers on staff. And it's a a beautiful, wonderful thing. And and it would make sense that if if a man was elder qualified, that that by definition of being elder qualified, he would raise pastoral elder qualified children, of which my father has done and Kim McMullen has done, and I'm endeavoring to do. Jesus had two sets of brothers and three sets of cousins on his team with the apostles. And we're not going to hire family because it's a policy? Like, 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 okay, nepotism maybe is a thing, you know, a construct of our psychological age. But folks, if we can't do ministry as a family, then we shouldn't be doing ministry. Okay? 
And so uh, we, we glory in the fact that we have multiple, almost every Sunday, there is some sort of family connection on stage. Jacob playing the bass here, that was his son playing the drums. Because there's a father discipling his son with the heart to be a worship leader. I love that. I would never want to say, well, Jacob can't be up here because, you know, we don't do ministry as families together. What? Well, it's an HR policy. My gosh, I get HR, but if you don't get me started on HR. HR, (laughs) wow. Human resources, the Greek word for demons. I mean, it's just crazy. (laughs) You try to follow the HR laws in Washington, you're going to go insane, right? That's another story. What was my point? My point is, I can't remember. So let's keep going. (laughs) Number one, the Holy Spirit speaks to us in community. And here's what I mean by that. Nothing more than this. Can God speak to you on your, on your own? Absolutely. On a mountain, by a lake, on a walk, 100%. And God oftentimes speaks to us when we're in community. And when I say in community, I, I mean like we're in here. We're, 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 we're gathered in a city group. We're gathered to worship. We're, we're praising his name. We're worshiping together. We're in his presence those are contexts in which God loves to speak to his church. Not only does the Holy Spirit to speak to us in community, the Holy Spirit speaks to us through community. We're here in this text, and it says that the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. How did they discern that was what God was saying? I don't know. It doesn't tell us. But I'm guessing they, they had to kind of talk it out. Hey, did you hear that? Did I hear that? Like, are, would you confirm that? I mean, like, they're discerning the voice of God through community. And if you disconnect yourself from community and then claim to have heard from God, I think personally you're on thin ice. God's, God's voice is always, always, always confirmed through community. So if you're here and, and you say, well, God, God spoke to me such and such, but no one in your Christian community affirms it. And I don't mean like just any Christians. I mean like godly, wise, mature Christians. If no one affirms and confirms that, you should question if you heard from God. So while it isn't detailed here how they discern the voice of God, it is clear that they discerned it together through community. So Holy Spirit speaks to us in community. It speaks to us through community. Oftentimes I've experienced the voice of God through the community I live in with, with my wife and our family and um, the elders. Uh, you've, you've, heard, you've, heard, you've heard the story of when we were in the COVID lockdowns and we were like, this is crazy. And we couldn't gather because they shut down our construction. They closed the pack. They wouldn't let us in school. So we had a thousand folks with no place to go trying to figure out how in the world do we do, we do this. And we're sitting at our dining room table and in the community of my family, my children very innocently and very purely, and I believe my kids are filled with the Spirit of God. They said, Dad, is it true that you can still get abortions, that cl- abortion clinics are still open? And I said, yes. Dad, is it true that you can still go down to the alcohol store and, and buy alcohol to drown your problems and, and booze? I said, yes. Is it true that, that every other well-intended small business in town that's not the abortion clinic and the alcohol store has been closed by the government? I said, yes, it is. Is it true that it's illegal to gather as a church and worship. And I said, I'm getting like the, the, the seventh inquisition here. I'm like, I'm like, yes, it is. I know these things. So like my kids, so you're telling me, dad, it's legal to get an abortion and kill a baby. It's legal to buy booze and get drunk and sink your, your problems and addictions, but it's illegal to run honest businesses or gather to worship the, the Jesus. And I said, yes. And then my children very earnestly said, well, then what are we going to do about it? And that's when Jesus spoke to me and said, hey, get off your duff and do something about it. So God speaks to us in community. God speaks to us in the community of our family. God speaks to us in the community of our city group. God speaks to me through the community of my elders and my executive team and my staff. Without them, I would have no confidence that I'm hearing from God. And so one of the reasons we organize ourselves to, li- to live in communities is because we believe God speaks through community. Somebody say amen. amen. Well, you're still awake. Okay, good. <laughs> Number three, the Holy Spirit speaks to us for community. Notice that what God's setting them apart for is for the sake of strengthening the community of God and growing the community of God. God's call never comes apart from his community where he speaks in it, through it, for the sake of it. This is really important. God doesn't give, specifically here, men a call of God for their own sake, to build a name for themselves, 
because they think it'd be a nice career path or because they'd like an indoor job. Which, by the way, if you think ministry is easy, newsflash, you're not doing ministry. Right? I mean, I mean, I mean you're just not because ministry is attacking the gates of hell, which is fun and exhilarating and occasionally challenging. And so God, the Holy Spirit, speaks in community as we live in community. He speaks through the community and he speaks to us for the sake of strengthening and growing the community. God works for the sake of his people, not for the sake of one individual alone. Amen? Amen. Number four, lastly, the Holy Spirit is given to the church to move the church on mission. This is very helpful understanding for us when we think about because well, we want to think rightly about the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is not given to us to confirm our individual relationship with Jesus and give us all the warm fuzzies. So we can, and, and, and he does that personally. Yes and amen. He confirms us as God's children. Yes and amen. And the Holy Spirit is given to the church to always be moving the church towards mission, towards the lost. If someone claims to be participating in a move of God and it's causing the walls of the church to go up and the focus of the church to roll inward, I'm highly suspect that that's a move of the Spirit of God. Because what the Spirit of God is always doing is drawing people in while simultaneously turning the hearts of those who are in outward to those who aren't. And we see that here, that God is setting apart for his work, these men, and then he's sending them out for the sake of strengthening and growing the community of the church. So how to recognize the call of God. This is for you personally or for us corporately as we endeavor to put ourselves under godly men and then follow godly leadership. Number one, and and I'm, I'm taking this from the text and from 20 plus years of experience of being around men who are called, men who aren't called, following leadership that has been anointed by God, following leadership that has, quite frankly, not been anointed by God. And it's come from my experience of sitting on the front row 20 years in, in, in intimate settings, uh, being present when God has called men to ministry. So number one, wow, that's small. Here we go. Is it bigger up there? A little bigger up there. All Christians are called to, to obey Jesus. So can we just un- under- underline that here? But some are set apart for a special kind of focused ministry. So we look at the text, the, the church is there worshiping, just like we're doing. There's a collective sense of unity and joy. And then God comes down to the Holy Spirit and says, I want you to set apart these two men, how does he say it, for the work to which I have called them. Meaning all of us are called to follow Jesus and obey him, yes, and God sets some men aside for a kind of focused ministry. So I, I, I don't want to downplay um, the, the, the priesthood of all believers that were, in one sense we're all called to be ministers of the gospel in our neighborhoods and in our families and in our workplaces. We go filled with the Spirit. We go commissioned by Jesus to share the good news. And there is a unique kind of um, calling to ministry that God places on some men's life that is unique that is different and set apart from the corporate calling he gives us as Christians. Secondly, understand the calling of God. The calling of God is orchestrated by circumstances that demonstrate a divine selection of God. Okay? I mean, no one's questioning here that, like, okay, the Holy Spirit is, is orchestrating this moment. We gathered, we're worshiping. He sovereignly picked out Barnabas and Saul, who would become Paul, among, I'm guessing, a, a, a large room full of competent, capable people, and God in his sovereign design said, him and him, I'm setting apart. And the call of God will always be accompanied by a set of circumstances that demonstrate a divine selection of God. And I wish I had time to tell stories. I'm going to tell one tonight, but I could tell dozens and dozens that I've got to witness firsthand where God is just moving the pieces on the board so divinely that no person could claim credit for it. No person could say, we orchestrated that. It's simply the divine orchestration of God to move circumstances to be in such a way that all who observe it go, that's the hand of God. I've experienced that this very week. So is Adam. 
And, and we have things we're going to share with you soon. But not tonight. <laughs> oh, you said it, bro. Where's Kent? Um, well, we, we got it. We got, we got to let it bake a little bit. We got to let it bake. Be cool. Play cool. But you won't be here this fall. So I'm going to say you want to be here this fall, September for our Be Fruitful campaign. But, but we're, we've witnessed personally this week and last week. And I mean, we've over and over and over again at Grace City Church, the divine orchestration of circumstances that no one man could coordinate that, that puts the stamp of authenticity on it, on a man, on his family, that, that is, that is, um, inarguable. God says, that's my man for the job. And if, there, if that is not accompanying a man's assignment to ministry, he, he, should, he should question whether he should do it. I, I had the great privilege of being at a seminary for a while, and, and most people who are astute, who have been to seminaries, are also gently and graciously critical to seminaries in that they were started with a wonderful intention to train up and equip um, men for the work of ministry, and those institutions drifted from being uh, um, connected to the church in which they were serving, and they eventually became uh, isolated, individually siloed institutions, raising up professional institutional men rather than equipping spirit-filled called men. That's very different. And so I, 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 was, I, was, I was in classes in seminary with men who thought it would be fun to go into ministry and, and got tired of working outside because you know, it rained a lot in Portland. And, and I've always loved the Bible, so let's go to ministry. Let's go into seminary. And so they were having their way paid for by someone and then just hoping to maybe get a job somewhere at a small Baptist church where the denomination would assign them. And I listened to them. There was, there was no burning heart. There was no specificity of calling towards a people or a work. They were, just, they were just submitting their resume for a job. And it did something deep inside me. What it did was it caused me to say, never on my watch will we peruse resumes to see who has the uh, strongest high marks to come take a job at Grace City Church. We will pursue the heart of God. We will respond in obedience to follow the call of God. And then as God brings opportunities and as challenges arise and needs grow, we will look up and see who God has brought around and we will test the calling in their life and we'll invite them into the work. And to this day, we have almost 30 people on staff, um, 10, 15 of those called men to pastor the church of God. And never once have I looked at a resume, not once. Every time we've invited those men in, we've looked, sat down with them, we've, we've said, we've been reviewing your resume for the last seven years as we've watched your life in ministry in this church. And we're here to confirm the call of God in your life and, and invite you to exercise the call of God that he's given you here in this place. Never once have we gone cold turkey to someone and said, hey, look, can we look at your resume? Yeah, you got high marks. You look like you got a lot of capacity. Uh, we'll give you a job. We don't give out jobs. We invite men to fulfill their calling. The calling of God is orchestrated by circumstances. Number three, the calling of God is accompanied by a deep sense of interpersonal conviction that will be sin to ignore. Called men don't go kicking and screaming. And, and there, was this, there was this kind of mindset as I was growing up and the church I was around that, you know, you know, be careful what you ask for. God might send you to, you know, Zimbabwe. And then you'd have to eat bugs and dress like a weirdo for the next 30 years. And who wants to do that? And that's kind of the sense I had for, for, for missions. Well, it was, it, was, it, was, it, was a horribly, it was a horrible misunderstanding of how God called. God never sends men to the mission field. He hasn't first given them a, given them a, a deep love and affection for, or women for that matter. God does not call his ministers of the gospel to go into the mission field where they're like, well, crap. I guess I'll do it to be faithful and obedient to God, but gosh, I'm not going to have any fun. There might be resistance at first, but before they go, God will put in their heart a love for where they're going. So much so that, and this is what I tell uh, every person we've invited into the work of Grace State Church on staff, not just the, the men who are leading in, 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 in positions of authority and eldership, not just our pastoral staff team, men or women. I always say, look, here's the deal. If you could do something else, you should probably do that because this is going to be hard. And, and, and we're going we're gonna to 
You know, hire 10 people, pay you like eight people, and work you like 15. Like, like, like it's going to be hard. It's also going to be the best thing you've ever done, but, it, but it, won't, it, won't, it won't be easy. And so if you're like, oh, I could do this, I could do this, I could do this, and, and, and working at the church is one of those this, go do something else. I remember we did an exercise with our staff. Uh, it was at the, the shoe shop across the street from the pack when we used to meet in there. Wow, those were the days. And <clears throat> anybody remember the shoe shop? Anybody ever go in the shoe shop? Yeah, look at the whole, we got the home team here tonight. And um, thanks be to God for, for the, the old shoe shop. And we were doing a staff uh, all day, all hands uh, staff day in there. And I said, okay, I want you to come up with a word that describes um, I forget what the question was, why you're here or, or, or describes kind of whatever it was. And I was looking for like in different words. And, and so I, I, I said, I said, you got, you got 30 seconds, go. First word that comes to mind. Doom, 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 doom. Okay. I go to the whiteboard. Okay. Give it to me. First one calling. I'm like, Oh geez. Okay. Next one calling. I go down 25 pe- people later. They all said calling. And I'm like, guys, I'm like, okay, obviously I didn't get give you clear instructions, my bad. The assignment was to give me a word that describes in one word, the first word that comes to mind, like why you're here. And they're all looking at me like, what, what, what do you want, paycheck? You know, you know what I mean? Like, what are you, and it kind of hit me like, like, like wow, that's kind of profound. And that's kind of cool. Like everyone had a deep sense of like, I'm here because God called me to be here. To not be here would be, have been tantamount to me disobeying the call of God. And, and, and if you haven't experienced it, you might not understand what I'm saying, but there are things that God could call you to do that are not in the Word of God that would be sin to not do. Well, like, like it's sin to disobey the revealed Word of God. Yes and amen. There can also be sin where you, where you disobey um, the revealed Word of God to you through His Holy Spirit, where, either because of fear or anxiety um, or whatever kind of cloudiness in your heart where you just you say no to the call of God, you grieve the Spirit of God, that's calling. Where you're just like, I can't not do this. If I, if I didn't do this, I, just, I would explode. There's that deep sense of inner conviction that would be sin to ignore. That, that, that lets you know that what you're dealing with is calling. Number four, the calling of God aligns with, com- the, with the competency of a man's skill set. God will never call a man to do something that he has not been previously equipped for or currently equipped for. And I know the whole saying, God doesn't call the equipped, he equips the called. That's cute. And that's great. And I kind of get it. And I have never seen a situation where God calls a man to do something that is so wildly outside his personality, his gifting, his skill set, that it, would make, it, it just makes no sense. I never see that. What I always see is God bringing men and taking their previous um, giftings, experiences, uh, um, skill sets, and then realigning it so that it aligns with the work of God that they might not have previously seen, but it makes sense when they see it. And so I, I, I don't, I understand that God doesn't call the gift that he gifts the call. Like I understand the sentiment behind that and agree with it in part. But I also believe, so I'll, I'll say, and God is always equipping the called so that when he calls them into something, they will find that he's been preparing them for that their entire life. People always ask me, how long does it take to prepare a sermon? And my answer changes all the time because I'm always getting older. So to date, this sermon took 43 years to prepare. And in three weeks, as painful as this is to say, my sermons will have taken 44 years to prepare. Does that make sense? Because as I, as I sat down to prepare this sermon about five hours ago, I'm drawing on every conversation, every book I've read, every experience I've had, every meeting I've been in, every pastor I've met, to, to collate that into a message that makes sense and is faithful to the Word of God. I don't prepare sermons by reading commentaries. I prepare sermons by talking to Jesus, reading His Word, and then listening. And yes, read, yes, study, but I've been doing that for 20 years. And so when I say that, that God's calling will align with a man's competency and skill set, what I mean is when God, when God called Saul, who becomes Paul, to be his apostle of apostles, God had been preparing Saul from day one of Saul's life for that moment. So that when Saul stepped into that role of holy calling, it was like he was drawing on every past moment 
and wielding it in that moment for the glory of God. Number five, the calling of God is undergirded with the character of Christ demonstrated over time. God will never, God, God's team is not filled with talented jerks like many businesses are. You've heard that, right? Like, like, like talented jerks. And we, we have a policy, uh, we have just, uh, not a policy, it's a conviction on our team. We will not have a team of, of, of talented jerks. Meaning, if you're talented but a jerk, no matter how much talent you have, it could not override your lack of character and be worth the price of having you on our team for your talent. If you lack the character of Christ, you lack the ability to, to lead the bride of Christ. And so competency is essential and character is critical to being a man that can lead in the church of God and respond to calling. And, and that might seem obvious as I say that, you'd be shocked at how many denominations, churches, local church families and people give a pass on a man's character because he has some prominent or dominant personality or skill set. They're like, well, nah, I mean, he, he's kind of a jerk and kicks the dog and his wife's kind of, you know, not really thriving. And, eh, but boy, he can really X, Y, Z. You might be able to get away with that on a football team. You can't get away with that in the church of Jesus Christ. And to be honest, it doesn't work on a football team either. Because any good coach knows that no matter how skilled the dude is, if he's toxic in the locker room, it's a net loss for the team, no matter how many stats he racks up. It's the same thing in the house of God. There will be no anointing where there's a house being led by men who, whose character is compromised, which is why we take the character of the men who make up the eldership and executive team at Grace City and the men and women who make up our, our larger comprehensive pastoral team. We take it very, very, very seriously. A man's integrity with his finances, a man's integrity with his sexuality, a man's integrity with his family, a man's integrity with his marriage, a man's integrity uh, with his thought life, a man's integrity with his time. He's not idle. He's, 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 a, work, he's a worker. We take those things very, caref- uh, very, very seriously because to put a man who lacks the character of Christ in a position of leading the bride of Christ is to grieve the heart of God and, and, and is to shun the spirit of of God's anointing. It's a big deal. Number six, the calling of God is confirmed by the community of those around the man called. I said this before, I'm just saying a different way here. Um, if a man is called into ministry and the people around him are like, really? That's weird. Not a good sign. <laughs> but if as a man steps into that calling, everyone's like, dude, totally. That's a confirmation on that call. And what I've loved is, is almost all the men uh, that, that lead the, ch- the charge of Grace City Church, none of them went into ministry as a, as a career path. God has called almost all of them out of the career path they were pursuing and interrupted that, that path. And, and just like Saul was just doing his thing and God providentially, aggressively interrupted him. And so too almost every man on our team. And then lastly, the calling of God requires some sort of leaving in order to enable some kind of going. God calls them, and what does he say? Set them apart for the work I have called. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them. That's their sign of affirmation. We acknowledge that God has spoken. We confirm what he has said collectively in community. And then then number six there, um, all of us are saying we agree. This man has the call of God on his life. He has the competency to accomplish it. He has the character to undergird it. And we are all standing here as witnesses affirming this work of God. We gladly put our name on this man's life as, as, a, as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ to be sent out. And then what do they do? They placed their hands on them and sent them off. There's never a calling of God on a man's life or a woman's life for that matter that doesn't require some sort of leaving where they're currently at in order to go to where God wants them to go. It might not be physical leaving. It might be emotional leaving. It might be a professional disengagement to engage something else. It might be a financial leaving. It might be a leaving of a dream they had pursued in their heart. For me, when, when, when we started Grace Street Church, I had my real estate license that I was making a lot of money with, and I had my commission as a police officer where I could go and pick up a car anytime and go chase bad guys, which I loved. And the longer we started doing this and this started growing, 
I, I realized I couldn't do all of those things together. And there was a call of God rising in my heart that was being acknowledged and recognized and, and confirmed and affirmed by the community around me. And it was forcing forks in the road. And it was forcing decisions I had to make where I couldn't give my time to all these things. And I was like, I don't give away my real estate license because I can make good money for my family on the side with not a lot of work, to be honest. And God said very clearly, do less things better. And so for me, the real estate license represented a temptation to be divided by my attention. And so I eventually let that go. I spent money to get that, work and education to get that. That was hard to let go. It was a part of me leaving so I could go. And then eventually we started having kids, and, 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 I'm, and, I'm, and, and I remember very distinctly, we were, we were off of Bryan Street, and there was four or five of us that chased a gangbanger who just destroyed a car with a baseball bat up on the lawn, and the car's there, and we all roll out, and a couple of really fine officers who are still working there, and Justin Kissel was there that night, and we roll out, and we're guns drawn, and a gangbanger, and he's in the passenger seat, and he's fumbling in the door with his kid in the back. And we're yelling at the wife, turn the car off, turn the car off, turn the car off. And I'm like, gun on, in the door, front right, at his point at his head. And, he, and I'm, 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 like, I'm like, suspect in the door, suspect in the door. He's trying to get something, trying to get some. Brian Miller's there, working on the door, boom, shatters the windshield, uh, unlocks the door, pulls the door open. I'm lethal cover. They got taser cover. They yard him out, handcuff him. I look in the door. There's a 38 Special Revolver in the door that he'd been reaching for. And I thought, that dirt bag was going to make me put brain matter on the dashboard of his car in front of his two-year-old daughter. And I got pissed. I'll say it on Thursday night. I got pissed. I was like, how dare this guy put me in that kind of position? And the second thought I had was, what in the world am I doing? I'm not getting paid to do this. I'm volunteering my time. And no one wants to go to the church of a pastor that shot a gangbanger 10 years ago. Or maybe you do. I don't know. But, but it's, like, it's like, that just doesn't read well in the papers, you know. And so I started, started talking to my wife about, should I keep doing this and this and that? And, and that, another fork in the road. Another fork in the road. Where, where, where my heart was divided. I loved doing that stuff with the guys on the range and the SWAT team and the kick in the door. I, I love adrenaline. It was fun. And God's like, you can't ride two horses. And so I, I, we made a decision to, to leave that lifestyle, whatever you want to call it, to leave that there. Turn my badge in, my vest. That was, a, that, was a, that was a rough day, but a clarifying day. It was rough in that, like, there was grieving and mourning. I mean, the academy, it's work, night classes. That, that took a lot of work to get there. A lot of fun memories and times. And, there was a, and what God's calling me to is bigger and weightier and deserves the full attention of my mind and heart. So the call of God will always require you to leave something in order to go to something. Okay. Now, I said all that, a story of calling. And this is, what I, and this is where I was going tonight, in that God is, is adding to our ranks, and we're very excited to share that tonight. And if you've never been a part of, of, of this, we'd like to just lay our hands on a new pastor at Grace City and commission him and his bride into the work of serving Jesus at Grace City, like we're doing tonight. So uh, if, if you don't know, um, our, uh, we have a very... Uh, 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 active church family. And by active church family, I mean lots of babies being born. So thanks be to God for the act of marriage. And we're practicing it regularly. And that is resulting in poof, kids growing. And so uh, our nursery is busting at the seams and our kids spaces. I mean, we, it, it, it's kind of crazy town down there. And our Grace Kids has been led by two, three, four kind of part-time moms and their rock stars, Brittany Stumetz and Curry Apple and... Um, uh, Becky Binger and Jolene Hurst, and then all of their helpers and mentors, all of whom are amazing. Uh, but they're doing it in the margins of their life, and it, that, that can be very challenging and difficult. Um, and Brittany came to us a while ago, and she's like, look, I love y'all, but I'm drowning here. This, this is kind of crazy town, and I don't have the time to recruit and equip and lead and pastor. This is wild. And so we went on the lookout. And I'd always thought, well, we'll go find a mom who's... who's you know, the challenge with, with women which is a good thing, by the way, is they're always having kids, okay? And so uh, I don't know if you knew that yet, but, but uh, that's what happens with women who are happily married. And, and so uh, that takes time and attention, as it should, because the, the role of motherhood is a sacred calling. And so uh, I, I was down visiting um, Buddy Driscoll to his church, and he had recently hired a dude pastor for their kids right here. And he stood up, his brother actually goes to a great city. And he's like, hey, I'm new on staff here. And I was like, 
oh my gosh, why hadn't I thought of that? We need a dude pastor to lead our kids' ministry. That would make so much sense with ethos of who we are. Like, wow, I am so slow to the party here. Came back, talked with our girls. What if we hired a full-time pastor to oversee all Grace Kids? And they were like, thank you, you moron. How long did it take you to figure that one out? You know, so they didn't quite say it like that. They're more gracious and godly than that. But that was kind of the undertone. You know what I mean? Like, like yeah, hello, we're drowning here. And so that, that sent us on a search. And we had four or five or six guys uh, on the list. But one was kind of at the top. And then life got busy. And we were, and we were kind of just crazy doing things. And um, Adam sends uh, us a text, the elders, at 6.45 on a Friday morning and says, uh, this guy who was at the top of our list just texted me and said that he's moving to Montana. Montana? Montana. And, I, and, and you ever have one of those... Like, like nothing like starting a Friday morning with like, oh crap moment, you know, like, like what? I sit up in bed, Sharon's like, what? And I'm like, so-and-so is leaving. She's like, who cares? Rolls back over. I'm like, but you don't understand. And, uh, and so um, Adam said, he's coming to meet me here at seven. What's the play? And I'm like, uh, 134 texts ensued between myself, Adam and Kyle in the next 15 minutes. <laughs> My phone starts smoking, you know what I mean? And we're like, we're like, okay, okay you take the high hill. Okay, good winter's elevation. We gotta take this guy out. You know, so we're like trying to figure out. So I'm like, I'm like, Kyle, put me together an offer. Are we sure? Are we sure? Are we sure? You know, we're talking like, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, you know, put my pants on like this, you know, and and, um, and we go running down there to the um, the uh, just the first class offices I built for my elder team out there uh, out in the back parking lot. The job trailer is there, and um, and this guy's in there, and and we walk in, and he's like, hey. And it's me and Kyle and, and, and Adam. Come to find out later, he thought he was in trouble. He's like, when do three elders show up? He's like, this, I, I fear I, and so in his mind, he's like, we've been tithing. I haven't been gossiping. Uh, uh, I've been faithful to my wife. He's like going down the list, you know what I mean? Like, why are they here? You know what I mean? Like, so our records here show you missed a tithe last month. I mean, we don't, we don't do that, do we? No, I'm kidding. And so we sit down, and so they're talking, they're talking. And so uh, I said, hey, I, I said, so tell us what's going on. So, well, he said, um, he said as you know, I, I lost my job with the COVID vaccine mandates, refused to kind of cower to the, to the, the, um, the governor's you know, tyrannical uh, uh, mandates. And so I lost my job at a, at a job he loved and what I believe was called to do and equipped to do and was doing wonderful ministry there. And so for two years, I've been kind of trying to make it on my own and small, own small business and this and that. And we're, we just can't get out of the apartment we're in and can't seem to get ahead. And so uh, I applied at multiple states and, and um, eight, different state, eight uh, different states or state agencies. He was doing a drug alcohol uh, intervention, counseling, youth uh, intervention with troubled youth and high risk youth and just incredibly gifted dude. And he's like, so I got accepted at all of them, and, and, and I'm, I'm taking one in Montana because it's, it's near my wife's family, uh, where she's looking forward to being near her mom and sisters. And, I, and like, as he's talking, I'm just like, oh, crap, oh, crap, oh, crap. It's never going to happen. You know what I mean? Like, like a good paying job in Montana where they're still free, and, you know, and her family's there, and there's no way I'll be able to talk his wife out of going home to be a grandpa and grandma. Well, now they got young kids, so I mean, it, the dream's dying, right? So he's talking, and I'm like, I'm like well, super cool. I was like, look, since you're obviously leaving and, 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 and that's going to happen, we're free then to kind of kick around some ideas. Would you give me, just do me the honor of just listening for a little bit. Let me unpack some things. And then you considering what that might look like. So that ensued in the next hour and a half, me unpacking where we're going with the Be Fruitful campaign this fall, where we think God's going as a church family to start building a, a, um, a, a church that, that is a refuge for families, to strengthen the family, and how we felt like, the next phase of that is we, we need a family pastor who can come and really build up the ministry of Grace Kids and incorporate youth and Stitch and Anchored and young adults to be helping kids and, and, and free young families and the whole thing, blah, blah, blah. Lay it all out there and get done. And I'm like, so what do you think? And he's like, um, deer in the headlights. Like, I had no concept of this, no thought of that. Vocational ministry has never been on my radar. We practically have, we have like, we got like an apartment already lined up to sign a lease. We can leave, leave our tiny little apartment, and actually go to an apartment that has a kitchen and bedrooms. And actually we can live like we're actually in the first world country and be next, like we've, we've been working on this for like five, six months and, and we got confirmation. I already kind of accepted the job. They're waiting for me to say yes. Today, we got to call our, our, our realtor and say, yes, we're going to take this apartment and call my boss 
boss and say, yes, I'll take the job. And he's like, this is a lot to take in. I'm like, that's okay. Just, 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 would you be willing to pray about it? And he's like, well, okay. So we walk over to the church building. We, we walk, I show him all the, the stuff for this fall that you're going to get to see if you come back. It's going to be amazing. Show him all the pictures and pretty pictures, of all the cool stuff we're going to do. He's like, there's a lot to take in. If you pray about it, would you want to call your wife? We'll connect. He's like, yeah, we'll pray over the weekend. Let's, let's get together on Sunday or Monday. I find out later, he goes out into his car and starts crying. Not because he's a wuss, but because it's like, Lord, what the heck is going on? Like, like I've been praying and hounding heaven and pounding the pavement in five, six, seven, eight different states and agencies and getting jobs. And like, like what? After all that, a job right here in, the, in, in our hometown, my home church that I love. I mean, this is crazy, right? So he goes home. He's talking with his wife. I call him the next day. We're on the phone talking a little more, praying some more. And he's like, this is a lot to take in, bro. I get it. Kind of find out. Uh, we can't, we met again with he and his wife and, and he, he said, could you repeat what you said to me on Friday? Because after you said, what if you'd like to come, what if you consider coming building Grace City with us? He's like, I didn't hear anything for the next hour and a half. It was, it was like <laughs> concussion grenade. <laughs> and so he's like, I don't, I kind of forget most of it. And so I repeated it again for he and his wife benefit. And, and they began praying and I'm really condensing a long story here uh, into a short amount of time, but he got out here because he was on the other end of the country and God was like, you need to go this way. Got in a car, drove out, ran out of land when he hit Tacoma and Tacoma's port, stopped there, got into local church, shifted to another local church because he was pursuing community. One of the men there discipled him in that wonderful church, got him in community. That led him to eventually get in one I mean, and the strings of God's providence, those circumstances I was talking about, are just so finely woven in this man and his wife's story. Met his wife here. First Sunday he showed up, got invited into a community group, met his wife in a, in a community group, got married by Pastor Adam, discipled by the folks at Grace Sea Church. A man I had just met met in Arizona two weeks prior that we're going to bring up for the man conference is a dear friend of, of, of my buddy, uh, Mark Driscoll discipled him. This guy I'm talking about like 15 years earlier when he, I mean, it was just like, what Just crazy, crazy, crazy connections. So we get together with he uh, and his wife, I think it was on the Monday night uh, after that. And we get together with them and they're talking and processing. Um, they put the job on hold. They put, they put uh, the, the house on hold and she's asking questions. And I'm watching this wife who had the prospect of moving home to be with her family and around her parents for her young children that, that, are, that are growing up, her husband to get a full-time job with benefits so they can actually buy a house and, and establish her family. All that's just disintegrating. And I watched that this wife process it, ask questions, and then turn, and in her husband's confusion and weakness, speak confirmation and life into his life. And so that she was there actually uh, arguing for our case. And I was like, go sister. I mean, like, like, let's go. And she's like, God's gifted you. God's called you. I've, I've been telling you this for years. These men are seeing in you what I've always known is there. And I confirm this, and no matter what decision you make, and I'm going to support you in that, what I want to make sure is you hear what they're saying because it's, it's all true of you. You have, a, you, have a, you have the heart of God for the people around you. You're called to be in ministry. God's spirit is upon you. You're anointed for it. You're gifted for it. You have the character for it. And I just want to make sure you're hearing what they're saying. He's where they're just like weeping. And it's just this, the holy moments, holy moments where you're watching the helper, like the spirit of God, breathe confidence and life into her, into her man. So they go that, and I said, well, call us tomorrow. So he calls the next morning. And he says, he says, you know, you laid out the whole vision where you're going. And, um, and he, he, said, he said, but here's the thing. Montana's a big deal. My wife's family's a big deal. And I'm like, oh, here it goes. When you get turned down, you know, go to the prom. It's so frustrating. It's like, oh, and he's telling me how Montana's so amazing. And her family is going to be awesome. And grandparents are a big deal. And we're talking about legacy of family, which is why they're wanting to move to Montana and all this kind of stuff. And then, and then he told a story about a youth he'd been working with. And that youth uh, had been struggling with uh, depression and all sorts of stuff. And he finally got into a place of, 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 uh, of confidence and strength. And then the, the youth went back into the, the, the government school system and had horrible things said to them from teachers and, 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 and counselors in positions of authority and just kind of sent them back into a tailspin. And he's like, the need in this town to strengthen the hand of families is better than ever before. And as f- as for our household, we want to be a part of the work that God's doing, that we believe God's doing in Grace Hill Church to strengthen the hands of the families. So he said, uh, the Heine family is in. And I'm in my, um, 
well, I'm going to be honest here. I'm in my underwear in my kitchen on a Saturday morning because that's how we roll around our house. And I'm like, Whoa! I'm like, yeah, are you kidding me? You better not be joking. You better not put me on. Are you kidding me? Yeah, are you, are you kidding me? It's great. He's crying. I'm crying. This is, I know this is so wild, man. Can you believe it? We get together later that day with he and his bride and the elders. I haven't told the elders. He does the same fake thing about Montana's amazing and her family's amazing. And they're like, oh, crap, crap, crap. So we're staying. Whoa! And as we're talking, here's what he says. Um, um, uh, he, he, he says, oh, honey, tell him what your mom said. Like it was kind of like, like a, they had forgotten about it. And she says, oh, yeah, kind of funny. We, we called my, our parents to tell them last night or that morning, wherever it was, they, they moved quick that we're not coming to Montana because God's called us to participate in the work he's doing at Grace City Church. And we thought they'd be angry or sad or crying. We weren't sure. We were like, oh, letting them down. Like we're like, their grandkids are coming home and now they're going to stay in Washington. She said, it's funny. She said, I, we, I get done telling them this and my, mom, and my mom says, well, sweetheart, like that's, a, you know, I feel bad. I, we should be crying right now and I don't want you to think we don't love you. But honey, we just got to tell you, your dad and I, this is wild. Your dad and I haven't had a piece about you moving home since you told us, and it's been weird. And her dad goes, yeah, babe. He goes, I, I mean, we love you. We, we love you. You're our girl, and we love our grandkids, and we love nothing more. He's like, but we have not had a piece about you coming since you told us, and we didn't know why, and we thought that was weird. We thought maybe we were bad parents, so we weren't saying anything, but as you've unpacked what God's doing, we now realize God kept us from having a peace because he wanted us to confirm his call in your life. We're so excited. You're staying at Gracie Church. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? Like, how about some spirit-filled grandparents? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? So then she goes, hey, honey, tell them about what happened with your job. He goes, oh, yeah, 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 get this. He goes, so I called the state agency, uh, the head of HR or whatever that had hired me uh, for this position, and, and I called her last night, and I said, hey, just so you know, I want to be forthright and, and, and upfront with you. The reason I've put off accepting the job offer is because I've actually been called to full-time ministry by my local church here in Wenatchee, and that was never on our radar. We had no thought of doing that, and it kind of took us by surprise, and so I'm asking for a little more time to consider whether or not to accept your job or turn it down. But if you need to move on with someone else, because I know you got, I know you got a long line of candidates, that's fine. But if you're willing to hold off, I'll give you a, a decision tomorrow. And she says, he, she lowers his voice and she goes, she goes, I think that's so exciting. You should take the job at the church. <laughs> that's what she tells him on the phone. She, <laughs> and then she's like, she's like, I'm a Christian too. And she's like, the state doesn't need one more dude. The church needs more dudes. So you should take that job. Anyway, so she, so he's, like, he's, like, he's like the state HR lady. He's like telling me, don't come here, even though I hired you. Stay there and grow the church. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. So, so I say all of that uh, as a way to personalize and put a face on the text we've studied tonight. Because I could tell a story like that for every person on our staff. Not one person has come here as a career change or, 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 or up the ladder move. Every person has come here because God has supernaturally, divinely orchestrated the, or the circumstances in their life so as to put his stamp on them saying, that person is mine and I want them here. And so tonight what we're going to do is we're going to simply exercise, and the band can come out, uh, we're going to exercise uh, in the spirit of Acts what they did here, and we're going to put our hands on this man and his wife as uh, a new members of the pastoral team at Grace City Church and commission them into the work of God. And, 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 and they're, what they're going from is the field he used to be in. What they're going from is the dream they had to move home. What they're going from is living close to family and raising kids uh, with grandparents. What they're going from is the quote-unquote stability of a state job with great pensions and great benefits. What they're going from is the career path he'd been on his whole life. And what they're coming to is the work of God for the family at Grace City Church. And I can affirm and confirm for you that this is a spirit-filled man with a holy calling on his life that's been divinely orchestrated to move him here. And I can confirm the same for his wife. And so it's my honor to uh, welcome to the stage and introduce to you uh, Logan and Noel Heine. So Logan, Noel, come on up. Can you welcome him? Come on up. <laughs> and uh, I, I want to yeah, invite us to stand. And if you're on the pastoral team here, you come on up, guys. So uh, Kyle and Brian and Kent and Adam over there, I see over there. And let's see, Carrie's over here in the keyboard. Come on up. We'll just come around these guys here. Uh. 
come around these guys. Oh, good, here we are. Okay. So, Carrie, you can play with one hand and reach your other hand from the piano. There you go. That's good. That's good. So, uh, this, this is Logan and Noel. And the reason I told their story and didn't let him tell it because he'd go longer because he knows more details. Yeah. Did, I get most, did I get most of them right? Spot on. Spot on. All right. All right. So, um, Logan, we love you. We are so glad you're here. Uh, and we really love your wife, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> and uh, and uh, N- N- Noel, to encourage you, uh, all the elders talked about it and we shared our staff, that when you affirmed the call of God in your husband uh, at the expense of potentially losing life with grandpa and grandma, it was a moving moment for us as elders. And, and we left, we said, you know, no matter what happens, that's, that's one guy to ride the river with. That, like Logan did well when he found her. Uh, 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 he who finds a good wife finds a good thing. And you're a good wife. And uh, to watch you help your husband through this process was remarkable. I just want to affirm you in that. And, uh, and Logan, uh, there's different kinds of fishermen. And what you're going to find if you're, if you're a young dad here at Grace City and you, and you, and you, and you, and you just kind of brush up against the, the ecosystem of, of, of Grace Kids is Logan to come find you. He's going to find you. And, and he led a guy to the Lord on Easter uh, that he had been working with uh, at, the, at the Canyon um, Youth Center. And Logan, if you, if you remember, used to bring all the, all the youth in like the white jumper prison thing and they'd sit in the front row of the pack. That was Logan who was bringing those guys. And then, and then uh, the governor and all of his wisdom shut that down because we know that the worst thing possible for kids struggling with the law is to not go to church. And so uh, that couldn't happen for two years and, and, and Logan was forced to leave. But then they've started coming back since and Logan's Marco, boom, zeroed in on him and, and, and let him to Jesus, like put him on the spot, worry out with Jesus, you know what's going on, and just by the scruff of his neck, led him to the foot of the cross, got to baptize him on Sunday. And it struck me, there's different kinds of fishermen. There's, there's some fishermen that throw their line in the water and wait for a bite. There's some that throw their nets in the water and, and, and look at their clock. And then there are those that jump in the water with fins of goggles and a spear. And that's Logan. He's a spear fisherman. And, uh, and so it's a great gift uh, to our family to have him here. He's got a great heart for the family. God's given him two precious kiddos. Uh, and so they're right in the midst of what our families are going through here. God's given him a great evangelistic vision for our valley. He's leading a little start. So we've scaled up. We've hired three or four rock star uh, preschool and uh, pre-K teachers. He's leading that and helping spread that. And that's going to grow. There's a lot that we have on the radar that we're going to bring to you this fall that we're excited about that he's going to be a part of down uh, on the other end of the building at, at Grace Kids because we believe the future of the valley and the future of Grace City is our families and their children. And so we're going to turn our attention to those dear, precious folks and all the intergenerational relationships, grandparents to the children. So Logan, uh, we love you. We affirm God's calling in your life. We are so grateful you're here. And we acknowledge the many things you've left to be here, both of you. And we believe that God is going to reward you for that and bless you for that. And the days to come are going to be sweet. And so would you join me by just extending your hands to this dear, sweet, precious couple as we commission them to the work of God. Father, we acknowledge that uh, the Holy Spirit has set apart Logan and Noel for this work. We acknowledge Holy Spirit. We recognize that you've spoken through community in community for the sake of our community, that you're setting this couple apart for your good work. Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, your protection over their family. We pray pray blessing into their marriage and favor over their household. We pray that you would give them wisdom as they endeavor to parent and shepherd the hearts of the young children you've given them. We pray for um, evangelistic zeal and organizational skill and um, competence of of hands and a sharpness of mind and a tenderness of heart that would allow Logan to lead that ministry and equip the saints who are serving our children and to pre- prepare that ministry to grow, to meet the, the needs in our growing community of young families who are lost and overwhelmed and weary and need a touch from Jesus. Lord, would you come alongside Noel and equip her and strengthen her to be Logan's helpmate as she speaks life into his life and truth into his life and courage into his life as she prays over him and, and loves him and serves him and, and walks with him and challenges him. Lord, would you fill her with your spirit as we have observed to be the helpmate that he needs so that as they serve here in this church family, we would benefit from the combined strength and unity of their we tree 
that they're farming together. And Father, we commission him into your work. We send him into the mission field here at Grace City and beyond with an excitement of heart to see how you're going to use him in the days to come. We affirm tonight, this night, this little band of believers, that this man has your mark on his life. And we're grateful that you set him apart to send him to our community. We ask that you would empower him for this work in Jesus' name. Everybody say together. Amen. 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 Can you welcome him uh, on the team here? Yeah, yeah, yeah.